My name is uh, Max Feinde. I come from the Sweetgrass First Nation in uh, Treaty 6 territory in Saskatchewan. I'm the co-executive director of Canadian Roots Exchange. Yeah, the target age group is uh, young people generally. Uh, we work with um, uh, you know, folks in, in the elementary school system uh, and uh, folks as old as uh, 29. The aim of the program is to uh, advance reconciliation uh, broadly. Now, generally, we do that through uh, building relationships and giving young people the opportunity to uh, engage with, uh, with Indigenous people, give, uh, give Indigenous young people the opportunity to engage with, uh, with non-Indigenous communities, including newcomer communities, including you know, uh, the first settler, uh, descendants, all that sort of stuff. So it's really about uh, bringing people together and exposing them to the idea of reconciliation. And on top of that, exposing them to um, exposing them to elders, to ceremonies, to land-based um, activities and programs as as a as a, uh, a way to view reconciliation. You know, something that we often hear from our participants, um, whether they are in you know elementary school, high school, university, whether they're doing their their master's degree, is that they often haven't had the the opportunity to uh, to engage with Indigenous people before. Um, you know, even though it's uh, 2018, even though um, we live in in Canada, a lot of people, you know, a lot of people think Canada is a, a great place of justice and equality and all this sort of stuff. We still live in a very segregated society, and uh, and Canadians often um, only have the stereotypes uh, of Indigenous people to fall back on because they don't have the opportunity to engage with us on more than a surface level, on more than a getting asked for money by one of our relatives on the street. That's their only point of engagement uh, with Indigenous people. So what we try to do <coughs> is, is show that Indigenous people are just that, people. And, uh, and that, that does wonders uh, for relationship building. We're not, we're not, we're not then only uh, stories on the news or, or stereotypes we are where they're friends, where they're, you know, uh, classmates, where they're, you know, uh, neighbors, all these sorts of things. For Indigenous people, I think it's very powerful um, because we have been uh, legislated out of society for a long time. We have been segregated uh, from the rest of society for a long time. There's a lot of folks who are, uh, you know, first generation urban dwellers or second generation urban dwellers who uh, haven't had exposure um, to, to the rest of Canadian society. Right now we're in Toronto. Um, people from you know 120 countries uh, live in this city. There's 120 different uh, different nationalities that have all come together here. I think um, it's good for our people uh, to learn about uh, those different cultures, those different communities, and build solidarity amongst one another to show that my well-being is connected uh, to those of my neighbors. My well-being. Um, is connected to the folks who are organizing in the multicultural community, who are organizing with Black Lives Matter, who are organizing with other social justice movements and in other communities. Uh, and it's good for our people to be exposed to the world. So I think that's the, that's the reciprocal nature of our programming. It's a, it's a give and take. It's a learn and receive model. So for us, I mean, this is certainly about Indigenous education, but more than that, it's, it's about exposing, again, that those... Uh, those uh, settler friends and relatives uh, to to our education. So anything, any of our programming uh, isn't just framed within Indigenous education, uh, but it's framed with a holistic sort of reconciliation model in mind. I think it's so powerful um, when we get knowledge keepers to come into our programs, which is something that we uh, we are uh, we are committed to doing, and uh, allowing for those folks who have grown up without their traditions. Uh, without their ceremonies, without their languages, uh, to be exposed to those uh, to those ceremonies, to those words, to those songs, to those practices, uh, for Indigenous people, that's so powerful. We've heard from our participants that that's a way uh, to access ceremony for the first time, or have a reliable um, uh, or begin a reliable relationship with that knowledge keeper, with that elder. Um, so that's that's uh, that's something that I'm committed to incorporating, not only the the sort of uh, uh, relationship building piece, which is of course important, but uh, diving a little deeper and incorporating the, the ceremony, the knowledge, the, the worldviews, the stories, uh, the language and the songs, not only for Indigenous people, but for, for non-Indigenous people as well, to show um, that we, we actually, uh, we, we have a worldview, you know, we have a culture, we have, uh, uh, you know, and we had before colonization, distinct and complex societies 
uh, with rules and laws and protocols uh, that were well established and clearly defined that our knowledge keepers can come in and, uh, and explain and talk to the young people about. So then um, we're not just, uh, we're not wards of the state, we're not savages, we're not, you know, uh, uh, you know, people who are terra nullius, who are empty in nature, um, but we are, we are proud, um, uh, complex, uh, you know, people who are descendants from proud, complex nations. Talking with our participants, we have a, a, a strong national network of, of volunteers who we've engaged for the last nine years, uh, who are very, very loyal to us, who talk about um, the uniqueness of CRE programming. Um, you know, we, we, we have close relationships with them. The more formal ways, I think, uh, like, like a lot of nonprofits, we struggle with the right way to uh, thoughtfully evaluate our programs and adding on and, uh, the component of, um, of working with Indigenous communities, finding the right way to uh, evaluate um, land-based programming or evaluating, uh, you know, it's, it's, for me, I struggle with how do you evaluate an elder, right? How do you evaluate the knowledge keeper, right? It's, it's, so we, we uh, it's an interesting question because we are unique in that, uh, you know, I'm going to keep getting this particular elder um, uh, because I know that they're very knowledgeable, I know that they're very well respected, and they sit within a certain position within, um, within knowledge societies, right? Um, having said that, we, of course, uh, this past year we engaged a, uh, an evaluation uh, company to, to come in and talk with us about uh, what evaluation for intercultural programming looks like um, to sort of brainstorm ideas about um, what is unique, what are the unique needs that CRE is trying to evaluate, and how do you make sure that you're getting it right in a culturally responsive sort of way. So we've we've begun that work, um, and we are we are currently uh, formulating a new way to evaluate with all of those those trainings, those conversations, and those ideas from that from that company um, in mind. So stay tuned. As a country, we're on a journey of, of reconciliation. These past, um, the past, you know, two years that the that the TRC final report has been out, um, people still do not understand, by and large, what it means to work with Indigenous organizations. They think that uh, that it should be as easy as working with a working with a non-Indigenous organization, and um, without recognizing that we do things a little differently. We have different rules that we follow, and uh, and we have more sort of accountabilities. Uh, certainly, I do than just my board of directors, right? So, so you know, on top of being held accountable by my board of directors, I also have my family, my community, our participants, all this sort of stuff, uh, which hold me accountable to a different standard than a non-indigenous organization would. Um, people are slowly learning what it means to work with an indigenous organization, and that it takes uh, more patience. It takes a different worldview, it takes a different understanding, and it, and it requires some serious self-reflection on our, on our partners, our non-Indigenous partners that we work with in figuring out what their, what their motive is, what their, um, what their role is, and what an opportunity exists for them to help advance reconciliation for young people across the country. You know, for me, Indigenous education, I was lucky to be raised with um, with um, my teachers, my knowledge keepers, my ceremonies, my songs, all that, all that sort of stuff, mm. and uh, and it often, I often have to remind myself that not everyone was as lucky as I was, and not everyone has uh, the clear understanding that not only were we, yes, a hunter gatherer society that that had uh, um, you know roles and responsibilities for each community member, including leadership and including elders, including. The, uh, male, female, and and the the transgender two spirit uh, community within our societies. We had roles for young people. We had roles for for uh, you know adolescents. We had roles for um, everybody, healers, and all this sort of stuff. Um, but we were also engineers. You know, we were also doctors. We were also um, we also had uh, you know, for lack of a better word, we had lawyers. Right? We had a legal system. Um, we had all these sorts of things. When we talk about um, what indigenous education is for me it's about uh, it's about being able to learn those things and be able to transfer uh, the knowledge that I have to other young people to show um, that yeah you know we, we made teepees or we made longhouses and yeah we, we participated in in powwows you know and ceremonies and dances and all this sort of stuff but it's so much deeper than that it's so much 
more than that, that indigenous education is so is so um, is so complex, is so is so deep that uh, that in a lot of our programming, a lot of the conversations we're having, even as an indigenous community, we're only beginning to scratch the surface on uh, all that exists and all that was and all that still is there. Um, but uh, you know, I, I, to to your to your um, to your question, I think uh, Indigenous education is uh, is uh, reconciling uh, all of that and being able to uh, have those conversations um, and being able to expose our children to those conversations at a pre-K, you know, primary, uh, middle, high school, and university context, so that they can learn about all all that we uh, used to be, all that we continue to be. And uh, go as far as to figure out what comes next, and how do we how do we decolonize ourselves to get back to those perspectives, and then advance forward beyond that. That is something that we hear a lot about: young people feeling like they are walking in both worlds, having to you know navigate um, both of those things, walking the tightrope, all that sort of stuff. If you go too far to one side, then then you'll fall off, and and your community will hate you, and you'll become too Canadian, too white. If you go to the other side, you come to Indian, and you won't be able to hold a job. The rest of society will hate you. All that sort of stuff. Uh, it's it's really difficult to to navigate for young people. I'd say it's one of the one of the top struggles um, that Indigenous uh, Indigenous young people uh, face um, today. Um, for me, uh, you know, we we uh, we recognize the struggle that exists. All that I can do. Is provide uh, provide information, provide opportunity to learn about uh, these sorts of things, but also provide that uh, that normalization of of our of our culture, that normalization of uh, of the pride that we all should have. Right, a lot of uh, other cultural communities, um, you know, I'm from Saskatchewan. Uh, Ukrainian people make up a large percentage of the population. They're very proud people, as they should be. That's a beautiful culture. Um, we should be just as proud and not ashamed uh, of ourselves. We should be able to, you know, go and speak our languages to 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 our peers, to our friends, without any sort of hesitation. Um, we should be able to to carry ourselves um, very very with with ease um, within, you know, an urban context and uh, and and uh, celebrate who we are. Um, I think uh, we're we're lacking that as a community. We're lacking that. Um, and certainly in past generations, I think uh, this generation is becoming increasingly more proud of being Indigenous. There's still a lot of work to do. And, you know, I think until um, we can, we see more people who are, who are uh, expressing their in Indigeneity in, uh, in everyday contexts and constructs, um, we'll, have, we'll have a ways to go uh, towards, normalizing, um, towards normalizing the ability to feel that sense of pride uh, that understanding of who we are and celebrate um, again all that we all that we were all that we are and all that we we have yet to be. There's so much opportunity that exists. Um, you know, if I think about uh, if I think about the last ten years, you know, where we were in in 2007. Um, that was before I don't know more. That was before you know this big awakening. That was before we started talking about reconciliation. As, as a country, you know, we're going to um, we're going to be telling uh, our children stories of of what we grew up hearing. And again, you know, when I when I was growing up in Saskatchewan, I heard the names Neil Stonechild a lot, and and, and, and Daryl Knight, and uh, and Rodney Nastis, and these men who were who were um, dropped outside of Saskatoon in minus thirty temperatures. These Indian men, and they were left to die. The Starlight Tours. Yeah, the Starlight Tours. And um, and uh, you know I when I think about in where we're going to be as communities and as a society and where Indigenous education is going to be in ten years, I want those I want those uh, I want those stories recognized, right? I want uh, I want uh, I want uh, folks to remember those names. I want uh, I want Canadians to to really uh, sit with the the horrors and the injustices that have happened, not historically, but in our lifetimes. You know, and we're young guys. We're in our twenties here, you know, and uh, and recognize uh, before we can reconcile, we have to we have to recognize uh, all that uh, all that has been done in the recent past, you know, even 
Um, you know, last summer we saw what happened in Saskatchewan with Colton Bushy, right? And recognizing that there's still this deep, deep racism that exists. So when we when we talk about the the future of Indigenous education, the next ten years of Indigenous education, you know, I would love to see um, more uh, more curriculum being developed in in science and math and English and you know gym and you know all this sort of stuff for for the for the kids in in primary schools um, to be able to engage with Indigenous society because we have contributions to make in every subject in every subject. Um, we have contributions to make, and they should be included in the curriculum. Um, but we also have to have to recognize and have to remember that while we're advancing and doing our nation building work, that's so so crucial, and a lot of young people are are are, are focused on, which is great. Uh, there's those of us who who are who are able to again walk that tightrope, mm -hmm. who are able to participate in both sections of society, who have to work on this reconciliation piece here. And, uh, and make sure that Canadians are held accountable um, to, to their history, um, that Canadians are held accountable uh, to the calls to action, Canadians are held accountable to that, uh, that treaty relationship that we first envisioned, that our ancestors first envisioned uh, when settlers came here of peace, prosperity, and mutual benefit, right? And I think that's, uh, that's something that I'm committed to doing. Um, that's something that I'm, I'm working on. That's something that hopefully um, we'll, we'll see a, a great deal of progress on in the next 10 years. And so I grew up, I'm, I'm half Norwegian. My mother's, my mother's a very proud Norwegian uh, descendant uh, uh, from rural Saskatchewan. Grew up on, on the farm of, uh, of my grandparents. Um, you know, a lot of time around that, that side of my family. I also grew up uh, on Sweetgrass First Nation with, uh, with uh, my father's side of the family. I, re I realized um, that that was a unique position growing up in, in the in the 90s to have connections on both sides of, of those families that were very, very strong. Um, I realized, I think, before a lot of other people in Saskatchewan, Canada, that we are more alike than we are different. Uh, and that, uh, you know, we have these, uh, we have these uh, divisions set up to, to, uh, to trick, trick us into hating one another, right? And, uh, and that was the point. That was the point of what the government uh, tried to do, tried to get people to not like Indians, tried to get Indians to, uh, to, to stay, uh, to stay uh, within the reserve boundaries um, and not be able to succeed. And then eventually they just die out and go away. Um, so when I would go and visit my, my father's family and I'd go and visit my mother's family, I'd realize that these people laugh at the same sort of jokes. These people uh, love me in the same way. These people uh, work in the same way. They want to provide for their families. They want the same things uh, to come out of their life. Um, I'm in a I'm in a unique position that I understand that I understand those people. I understand uh, both sides of the the treaty relationship. I can see uh, a clear path um, to how we get back to that because it happened at my birthday parties. It happened at my Thanksgiving dinners. It happened at my at my family celebrations where. Indigenous people and non-Indigenous people came together with, you know, and wished each other prosperity, uh, mutual respect, and and and, uh, and wanted each other to, to benefit from the prosperity of this land. Um, I've seen the ability for us to do that in a in a very micro uh, in a very micro way with my family. I think uh, that uh, that through telling those stories and bringing young people together, uh, we can begin to see. We can begin to see that at the macro level across this country. So we've been in uh, 15 different communities across the country, uh, from coast to coast to coast. Um, we have participants every year from every province and territory uh, through our different programs, and we've engaged, you know, uh, all for, you know First Nations, Métis, Inuit, uh, first generation Canadian. Um, to you know the the descendant of, of the first settlers, so we get a great perspective of the the Canadian project thus far, and we get to bring in those voices to figure out what comes next. Now I'm a I'm a big believer um, in the idea that you know we're hosting a conference in a couple of weeks, a national conference. Um, 250 young people, half Indigenous, half non-Indigenous, are going to be there. Uh, I really believe that you know the next Supreme Court justice is in that room. I really believe that uh, the next uh, Grand Chief from uh, the Yukon is in that room. I really believe that the next members of Parliament or City Councilors or Mayors or or CEOs, you know, or or um, you know, uh, 
whatever, are in that room. Those are the folks who are going to be making key decisions for our country in the next 10 to 20 to 30 years and, and beyond that. Um, we need to invest in, in the, the, the education of young people um, that they're not getting from the provincial system mm -hmm. as it is um, to really dive deep and explain uh, the importance of remembering our history. Uh, explain the importance of, of uh, including partnership as a crucial element of the Canada that we want to build as, as, as millennials, as young people. There's a study done by the Environics Institute uh, about a year and a half ago that said that 79% of young people aged 18 to 29 believe that meaningful reconciliation can occur in their lifetime. 79% higher than any other demographic uh, in Canada. So when we talk about reconciliation, yes, you can sort of triage uh, the pain and the suffering that's happening now and try to talk to the boomers um, about, you know, making more uh, thoughtful decisions, making more uh, decisions that include Indigenous people as partners, all that sort of stuff, but you can only triage it. If you want to begin to uh, change and heal the damage that has been done to our communities or people in this country, then you have to invest in, in the long-term development of this next generation of leaders, and that's what Canadian Roots Exchange believes in doing. You know, we need the ability uh, for for adults, for our parents, for our aunties and uncles to um, to trust us. We need adults to uh, to realize that young people not only have the passion for reconciliation, not only have um, have uh, have a vision uh, for this country, but we also have the ability. To see it through, and they that that is shown by the last nine years of programming that we've done. We really need young people to be able to lead, uh, to be given uh, real uh, decision-making powers, um, and thoughtful engagement in uh, in uh, decision-making bodies. We also need the opportunities to to broaden our coalition of young people. We need school boards. We need uh, individual classroom teachers. We need principals. Um, to, to recognize that they weren't trained in how to do reconciliation work, they weren't trained in Indigenous education, and then they need to let organizations like Canadian Roots Exchange uh, come in and, and expose young people uh, to this work, to these thoughts, to these ideas, to these, um, to these truths, to these histories, and, uh, and, and to, help, uh, to help guide their education uh, so that they, can, they, they are not robbed of the opportunity to learn about the beauty, the strength, um, and the, the partnership that they can have with Indigenous people as, as every other past generation has been. It's, it's something, you know, that people don't think about, you know, people don't know anything about Indians um, or Indigenous peoples, um, and that was purposeful, right? I remember my mother telling me uh, very clearly that when she was in, you know, the one-room schoolhouse in Saskatchewan growing up, um, that her teacher told them that all the Indians were dead, that there was no, no Native people, and that's why they got to live here. Right, so it was it it was purposeful that that these people who are in these decision making uh, decision making powers decision making positions today uh, don't know anything about our people and aren't thinking about um, the rights of Indigenous people aren't thinking about how this impacts the treaty relationship aren't thinking about um, what uh, what partnerships can can exist uh, within their within their sphere of influence uh, because they weren't given the ideas or the opportunities to learn about it. I'm a big believer in meeting people where they're at. We've we've uh, we've started to um, have conversations with Canada now, and a lot of Canadians are horrified uh, to learn what their country did in the name of settlement, what their country continues to do uh, in the name of you know keeping the wealthy wealthy and keeping the power where the power is. Um, you know we have uh, we have Canadians who have always thought of themselves as as very patriotic, very uh, very proud to be from Canada because they are from uh, this great. Uh, this great country that is seen as the human rights defender on the global stage, while uh, Indigenous communities sit without water, uh, sit without uh, uh, access to mental health supports, and young people are killing themselves, sit without uh, uh, the ability uh, to get an education, all these sorts of things. Canada isn't the, 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 you know, the good guy that uh, a lot of Canadians think uh, it is. Um, when I have those conversations with Canada, you know, or with Canadians, um, I make a lot of time to listen uh, to to uh, to their revelation that Canada isn't the great uh, the great uh, country they thought it was, uh, and then um, you know as they sit there and sort of uh, 
uh, a stupefied reflection, that's when we that's when we call them to action. That's when we tell them that they they have work to do. That they are uh, the vice president of a bank, or they are uh, a, a faculty member in uh, in English, or they are you know they are this that or the other thing in the world. Everybody has uh, the ability to impact uh, the advancement of, of reconciliation. Everybody has a role to play. And everybody has a job to do. Um, I think it's it's incumbent upon us, those of us who have uh, who have decided to to participate in in reconciliation on the indigenous side, to help guide them and show them the way and show them uh, the past and show them the path forward. I mean, the problem that I see with reconciliation today is it's focused so much on. Uh, our government, which is, you know, it's important. They, they have a role to play in reconciliation, absolutely. They are the, the representative of the crown in this country. Um, focuses on our universities, again, very, very important. I want universities to focus heavily on reconciliation. That's where, again, a lot of these, uh, a lot of these uh, leaders are going, to, uh, are going to come from, is, is post-secondary landscape. Uh, it also focuses in cities which, um, you know, makes sense, a uh, high population would come from there, more, more indigenous people than ever live in cities. Um, the thing that frustrates me is that we don't see a lot of, um, a lot of time or attention or, or column inches uh, spent on, uh, you know, what's happening in, uh, in uh, rural Alberta, right? What's happening uh, in the high school in Kelowna, you know? Uh, what's happening with young people in uh, in Gimli, Manitoba, you know, there's uh, as you know, as I just said, there's a role for everyone to play in reconciliation, um, but too often we're focused on our governments, our cities, and our universities. It doesn't matter where you live in this country; you should have the opportunity to be able to thoughtfully engage and uh, contribute to the movement of reconciliation. You know, I, I know that uh, we work a lot with young people in uh, in Happy Valley Goose Bay. We've worked with young people in Rankin Inlet, you know, in, in, in the far north of uh, Nunavut. Mm -hmm. And uh, those young people, those teenagers who are sitting there in, in their high schools or in their, in their elementary school, um, they may not make it to university. Some may, some may choose to stay within their community. There are a lot of folks in downtown Toronto um, who may not make it to university. You know, that's just statistically speaking, that's both Indigenous and non-Indigenous. Uh, if we focus just on university, then we create this uh, this uh, this power hierarchy where reconciliation is only accessible to those who have the ability to participate uh, within within the the academy. And I think if we if we've learned anything from our history as Indigenous people, um, you know that uh, that exclusion. Uh, that uh, that creating uh, that creating you know different uh, different hierarchies of of, of knowledge, uh, creating you know um, systems that that privilege uh, some folks based on their their abilities or, or what have you. Uh, that that isn't helpful. That uh, that doesn't serve our interests. That's actually what has been used to uh, to uh, keep us keep us oppressed for the last you know few hundred years. Um, I think it's important that, uh, that young people are exposed to the ideas of reconciliation as early on in their educational careers as they can be, um, including, you know, grade one, uh, grade three, grade five, grade seven, whatever it is. Um, and that's why we work with, that's why we work with um, young people as young as grade seven. So I work in high schools to, to make sure that at, uh, at a few different points within their education, they have the opportunity to engage with, with someone who's of their generation. Um, so they can thoughtfully think about uh, what their role is and normalize the ability to treat Indigenous people with compassion. I think that's what's going to change the country in this next generation. You know, I think uh, we're going to see a big shift in the next, uh, in the next few years in, in uh, how the movement uh, is progressing. I think um, reconciliation, if you, if you look back to, to when the Truth and TRC uh, started, um, and you look to now, uh, you'll see just how much the movement has changed. I think reconciliation is going to be known as one of the, the reconciliation movement is going to be known as one of the um, fastest adapting, uh, quickly changing, and 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 agile uh, social movements uh, in the history of uh, of this country, possibly even the world. Um, 
because we are more connected than ever, uh, because we have young people who are willing to uh, to uh, shift their thinking around what they what they've been taught in schools, and uh, and have a real passion for seeing results. Um, we're not we 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 certainly are and have, and you've seen that through. Um, through Idle No More, we've been uh, taking to the streets, and we've been protesting, engaging in um, sort of traditional behaviors that social movements do. Um, and I think that's really powerful. That sends a, a strong message to the public that we're out there, we're organizing. Um, but we're also uh, permeating the, the system. We have people working within um, uh, systems of power who are making the the day-to-day -day change, who are doing uh, that sort of work. I think, you know, going back, going back to your question, um, we are a organization who, who has been trying to react to this change, who has been uh, re-examining our programs, who has been responding to the needs of young people uh, to engage in reconciliation. I'm, you know, I'm one of the few people, um, you know, uh, who's, who's trying to work himself out of a job. You know, I don't want to be doing this forever. I want, I want reconciliation to be uh, achieved. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't think, uh, I don't think uh, we want to see a Canadian roots exchange forever. Right, because we want to see these these problems, these disparities, these gaps um, closed. We want to be on par with uh, with the rest of Canada. We want to be respected. We want um, you know we want equity uh, from this country. Um, and I think you know we would we would love to have uh, young people who believe the same. Uh, we would love to have their vision, their voice, their experience, their passion, their dedication, and uh, and their ability to contribute um, in that way. And we'd love. To for them to be part of, of series programs so we can get there together.